Hello and welcome to Spotlight on Tutoring Mathematics with SP Tutors. We're absolutely delighted that you've joined us. My name is Lizzie Swan and I'm part of the SP Tutors core team, creating a bespoke and responsive training program for tutors. Achieving the SP Tutors vision of accelerating progress for children's learning especially those most disadvantaged during the COVID-19 pandemic through high quality, evidence-informed tutoring. SP Tutors have collaborated with Anne Spear Publishing and John Cat Educational to create a mobile learning app, Tutor Know How. Tutor Know How places tutors in control of the time, place and pace of training. These live spotlight sessions form a key element of our specialist training. Devised and delivered by a range of expert practitioners from the SP Tutors Network, these sessions enhance tutors' evidence-informed practice, highlighting the best and most up-to-date research. In this session, I'm proud to introduce Anna Tapper and Sam Phillips. Anna is the primary maths advisor for Unity Schools Partnership in Unity Research School. She's worked as a teacher and maths lead for 15 years, is an NCETM accredited professional development lead and has recently worked with the Education Endowment Foundation, writing the training materials for improving early maths. And Sam Phillips. Sam has been working as a secondary maths teacher the last 15 years in schools across Norfolk and Suffolk. He's also an NCETM accredited professional development lead, a secondary mastery specialist and director of In Addition Education. Sam and Anna are now going to introduce you to STP Tutors guiding principles to support evidence-informed practice for the tutoring of mathematics. I'm now going to hand you over to them here. Thank you both. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Lizzie. Can we move to the next slide, please, Joe? <clears throat> and the next slide, please. So at SP Tutors, we have come up with five guiding principles of tutoring mathematics, and these will be applicable in both secondary and primary. As, Liz as Lizzie announced, I'm a secondary specialist, and I'm going to run through the first two of these guiding principles, and then I'll pass on to Anna, who's a primary specialist. I should note these, all five of these can be used in both uh, disciplines and they're all interlinked so that the principles I talk about will be picked up by Anna as well. I'm also gonna go through some examples for you of the ways we could use these principles in some teaching. Next slide, please, Joe. So I'm gonna start off with the use of manipulatives and representations to support students when tutoring. So the use of manipulatives is really using physical objects to help students understand uh, the, con the conceptual um, understanding of uh, a maths uh, concept. Sorry. So we have, for example, on the screen, we have Dean's blocks, we have um, Cuisinaire rods, we have Numicon. Now these are commonplace in maths classrooms, but these can be used to support students to understand what is going on when we're talking about a maths concept. Now we can also use counters, coins. Um, this is how we might introduce students to, to a maths concept before moving on to the pictorial. So the pictorial is where we bring bar models in or we bring in um, a number line and this can help students see where we move on from the concrete. Finally, when students are ready, they move on to the abstract. So the use of numbers or letters to represent mathematical calculations. Now, what we have to understand as tutors is sometimes students are expected to work at the abstract, especially at secondary, but they're just not ready for it. And we need to understand that we can move backwards to support students. So where, for example, they're presented with ideas uh, and they're not quite ready, you can go back to the pictorial and draw a picture to help them understand what's going on, or even get, get some concrete objects out, get those manipulatives out to show them what's going on. So it's really key that tutors should support pupils using these ideas correctly to understand uh, the concepts more deeply. Next slide, please. 
So let's just give you an example of how, how we could use manipulatives. So quiz and air rods that you may be familiar with are wooden, wooden blocks that have differing lengths. And if I use uh, the smallest length to, to be a unit of one, I can represent factors using quiz and air rods. So for example, on the screen here, we have the factors um, from uh, looking at the numbers one to 10 and breaking them down. So we can say to students, well, for example, the number six, how could I represent that number six? Well, I could use one uh, quiz and air rod of length six, I could use two of length three, I could use three of length two, or even six of length one. And that is showing them what the factors of six are. Now, on top of this, we can then extend it into prime numbers. So when working with students with primes, we might say to them, well, a prime number has exactly two factors, itself and one. But of course, that can then be, um, there's some mis misconceptions that could come about there. And the common one is students thinking that one is a prime number and then forgetting it. By using manipulatives or a pictorial representation, they're far more likely to be successful. And remember that actually prime numbers have two rows to them and have two um, distinct factors. Going on from this, we can also look at uh, square numbers. So if I look at the square numbers here, one, four, and nine, I can see actually they have an odd number of factors, which is clear from, from this representation. And whereas all the other numbers have an even number of factors. By exposing the structure, the representation clearly shows this concept being taught. And of course, if I wanted to extend this, so I wanted to say to students, what, what about 11? How could I represent 11 in its factors? I can't use the quiz and air rods anymore because the maximum length is 10. So we can then move them onto the pictorial so they can draw it. And eventually we move them onto the abstract, which is much more efficient when they're ready. Next slide, please. Here's a common question that students often go wrong with. So let's have a look at this. Anna and Sam share 24 pounds between them. Anna gets three times as much as Sam. How much does Sam get? What do you think is the most common error that happens if this is presented to students? Pop it in the chat. What do you think students might do wrong here? I'll just give you 20 seconds or so. We'll see what comes up. What do you think the most common error is? Thank you very much, Jane, Karen. Uh, we've got dividing by three straight away. And, and you're absolutely right. And so what we need to do is, is to try and help students understand that if you divide by three, you're gonna get this wrong. Uh, it's a common error. Um, Joe, if you could show the next slide, please. By using a, a visual representation, this is called a bar model, we can clearly see that yes, Anna has three, but three times Sam means that Sam has to have one. So altogether, there are four equal size parts. Now this visual representation can help the students um, understand what's going on. And it's clearly 24 divided by four, and that will support students. Now I use bar models um, all through secondary, and I've introduced them to year 10s, year 11 students that have never quite got the concept initially, but as soon as a visual's there, it suddenly becomes a lot clearer and they become a lot more successful as a result. Next slide, please. The next guiding principle is using a blocked approach. So teaching an area in depth and teaching in small steps. If I use a sports analogy for this, um, footballers, for example, um, in order to, to fine tune their skills, they will work on an individual drill. They will work on passing or free kicks or shooting in their, in their training sessions. They won't just play 90 minute matches again and again and again. They fine tune the small steps so when they play in the big games, they are fluent in those skills and therefore as a, as a player, they're much better. We can use this idea in maths as well. We want students to focus on individual aspects, get fluent at those before applying it to the bigger uh, situation. They're much more likely to be successful by this approach. So, for example, if we look at a ratio problem, ratio tends to cause a lot of problems at secondary. Um, a shop sells blue hats and orange hats in the ratio of five to one. Um, and what we want to do is we want to focus on that first sentence, first of all. So what I would do here is I would get students to look at the language of this and how else it could be asked. I would also get them to represent that using uh, a bar model. 
So Joe, could you show the next slide, please? So for example, I could look at explore the language and we can consider how it might be asked in primary as well that might be slightly different, but it's the same context. So for every orange hat, five blue hats are sold. Um, a shop sells five times as many blue hats as orange hats. These are languages that the students have to be aware of so that it could be asked in different ways and they realize in the maths is exactly the same. Also, we've got that visual as well, showing that bar model to really reinforce what's going on. Now, if I want to go into a bit more depth here, Joe, could you show the next slide, please? We want to see that one week 60 hats are sold. Where's that 60 going to go? So let's see the representation here then. If you move them, there we go. So we can see now we've got the, the visual, we've got the five to one blue hats to orange hats, but now we can see that 60 represents all the hats. So we're looking at this one type of problem, but if I want to go into more depth, what I would do is I would change where that 60 goes. And this is what students um, sometimes find difficult if it's only shown in the abstract. So Joe, show the next uh, image, please. So now if I change the problem slightly, one week 60 blue hats are sold. The models is still exactly the same. We've still got five to one. And I'm just putting the 60 into that position that shows that it's now broken down into five equal parts rather than six. And finally, the last model. And of course, this is the area where students trip up most. This time it's 60 more blue hats are shown. So that 60 just represents four equal size parts. By using a representation and by teaching in depth, bringing in all of these elements, students are far more likely to be successful. And when I've taught students in the past, those that use visual representations find it so much simpler to work out what's going on. Next slide, please. And finally, this is why we do it, because when we give them much more complex situations, if they are fluent in a particular area, they're far more likely to be successful. Let's look at this exam question that came up in the 2019 summer exam series at GCSE. This was on the foundation paper. Now you can see there's a huge amount of information going on there. And if students are fluent in, for example, the ratio element, like I just presented, then that part there where it talks about Charlie, they can draw a bar model and they're going to be successful. If they don't have that approach and they've, they haven't got um, that fluent, then there's just too much going on that overwhelms them. So being fluent and confident in each area will give them much more success overall. I'm now going to pass you on to Anna that's going to go through the next guiding principle for you. Our next guiding principle is teaching for conceptual understanding. When we talk about children developing conceptual understanding, it's about them understanding why and how the maths works rather than just following a procedure. It's tempting when working with pupils to give them a structure or a procedure to work through, or maybe using tricks like perhaps you remember Keech keep change flip when dividing fractions and admittedly this will give them the correct answer however it does not develop their understanding of what's happening when we divide fractions by teaching for conceptual understanding we'll boost children's confidence in maths because they'll understand it we'll help them to make the links between other areas of mathematical learning and we will be supporting them to identify their own mistakes and know what to do when it goes wrong or they get stuck I've made a short video for you to watch of teaching subtraction using regrouping. I would, I'd like you to think about how the use of concrete objects supports pupils' understanding of the concept. I've chosen a subtraction. to illustrate how we can develop conceptual understanding when working with pupils. So here we've got the calculation 176 subtract 89. Now, when children are confronted with this, if they struggle with it and they're not sure what to do, the first thing they normally do is swap the numbers around. So they know that six take away nine is much um. I think it's a bit quiet. So what I'm going to do is talk over it as my fingers are moving. You'll see what I'm doing. So often with a 
problem like this, what children will do is they will swap the numbers around. They don't know how to do six take away nine, so they'll swap it over and do nine take away six, and then eight take away seven. So what we want to do is look at how we can support them by the use of concrete materials to do this um, and understand what they're doing. And I'm going to use something called Dean's Blocks. So this here is a thousand block and it represents 1000. And then there are slices of 100 blocks, which represent 100. And then there are tens, and they're in sticks. And then there are ones. And the great thing about Deans is that it is it, it works with our number system. So it works on base 10. And sometimes it's called base 10 in schools as well. So one, one is the same as will you need 10 ones to make up a 10 stick 10 10 sticks i'm just doing that very slowly will make up a 100 block i'm showing you there 10 of the 10 sticks make up a 100 and 10 of the slices make up a 1000 so children can physically build the number so then what i would do is build out that number for them. So I'm going to build, first of all, 176. So I've got my 100s, that's there. And then I'm going to add another six tens so that I've got um, 70. And then I'm going to add six ones. So we've got 176. Now instantly children can see that they can't take nine away from six and they're going to have to do something with that number to be able to take the nine away from the six. And what we want children to understand is that yes that number is 176, it is 170 and six, but it could also be 160 and 16. So what I'm going to do is exchange one of the tens over into the ones column so it becomes 16. You'll see me move that over. But we can't have um, a 10 in the tens in the ones column. We know that. So I'm going to exchange that 10 for 10 ones. Which my hands are showing. So I've put the 10 ones into the tens column and then we'd be able to take nine away. What you'll notice is that as I'm doing that I'm also using the abstract so I'm writing out the calculation and showing the pupil how I would do it alongside in a written method. As a stepping stone between that you can actually draw the calculation out as well so once children are really confident in what they're doing, they may not need the concrete materials because we want them, as Sam was saying, to move from the concrete into the pictorial and abstract. It's a flow and it doesn't have to necessarily go in that order. And you may move back again if they need more support. But the idea is that once they understand the concept, they can then draw it to give them that support. And they might draw a square, for, or they will draw a square for the hundreds a line to represent the 10 sticks and a dot for the ones. But they also need to see it in the abstract alongside. What I'm doing now is I can see that I've got six tens left in my tens column and I can't take away um, eight tens from six tens. So I'm going to exchange again my 100 for 10 tens. And as I said, the great thing about Deans is that they fit really nicely. 10 tens actually is the same size as 100. 
You'll notice the language I'm using as well. I'm talking about exchanging and regrouping. So that's the language that is used in um, schools now, rather than um, perhaps you might have been borrowing that you might be used to hearing. Um, and the reason we use that is because that's actually what we're doing. We're not borrowing. We are just exchanging the values around. So now I have 16 tens. I can take eight away. And I can quite easily see that I am left with eight tens. I can count them up if I need to. And so I know that 176 subtract 89 is 87. We look at our next guiding principle. So our, our next one is to make links to other areas of maths explicit. So some of the children you'll be working with will be those with lower prior attainment. And those children often don't have the confidence to think flexibly about number. We want to support those children to see the links between the different areas of maths. And the national curriculum states that maths is a highly creative and interconnected discipline. And in your work as tutors, you can support pupils to recognise this. In primary schools, a really clear example of this interconnectedness is through multiplication facts. By the end of year four, they're expected to know all of their times tables up to 12, by 12 times 12. And we can see, I just quickly put, pulled this map together of the things that I felt were related to times table facts, and I'm sure there are many more. But we can see already that if they know those times table facts, they will then be able to understand equivalent fractions and then calculating with fractions a lot easier. They'll be able to recognise and describe patterns that they might see, can generalise from that, which leads towards al algebra work. They can do multiplication and division calculations and long multiplication and division. They understand about factors and the difference between prime and composite numbers. They'll be able to calculate the area of rectangles. There's so many things that come from one specific um, area of knowledge in, in maths. And actually, we need children to see these links. And you have a fantastic role as a tutor, an opportunity to help draw those links um, closer together for them. So if we look, I've got a simple stats question here. This was um, from a paper a few years ago. And this is an area question. Um, and they're finding the area of the shaded shape. So to be able to do that, we're thinking, well, what what might might a child need to use to be able to find that well we know that when they find the area of a shape you're multiplying the two sides of a rectangle but they also need to find the shape of the missing the missing amount the white rectangle inside so when they're looking at area an array might help them jeff click on the next slide for me an array is simply rows and columns of dots to represent a multiplication fact so here we've got six times four and they can see the area of the whole rectangle but they can also see the area of the white rectangle and now there's another bit of information they're going to need to do they're going to need to know that they need to use subtraction to find that so we can by drawing these links for children we can help them we can help make the map of maths explicit for them so as we look at the next slide I think we're going to move to Q&A at the end. So perhaps if we have a look at the following one. Lovely, thank you. Um, so finally, our final um, guiding principle is to teach problem solving strategies. Now, as counterintuitive as it might sound, you don't get better at problem solving by doing by solving more problems. You actually get, need to be taught strategies to solve problems. And there are many ways that we can do this. And in the recorded sessions, we'll go into more detail about that. However, I was going to talk you through the way that I did it in a video clip, but I think the sound is playing up a little bit. I don't know, maybe if we try it again, we play and I'll just talk it through live what I did. So um, Joe, if you play the video clip, but mute it, I can talk it through. And I'm going to be doing this as if I'm working with a pupil. So I'd like you to think about the different strategies that I use. So imagine me tutoring a pupil. Okay, so this is our question. I'm going to read it through for you. A book has 276 pages. Amina has read one third of the book. 
how many pages are left for Amina to read? Tell me what you noticed about that question. Yep, okay, so the book has 276 pages um, and Amina's read one third. Yep, and the question is asking us how many are left? All right, so let's think about what we mean by that. I want you to imagine your own reading book. What's it mean? It means that you've read a portion of the book and you still have a portion of the book left to read. So that's what's happening in here. Have a look at the bar model that I've drawn out. So why have I put 276 as that top bar? Okay, I've put that because that's the total amount of pages that the book has. Then I've split the, the second bar into thirds. Why have I split that second bar into thirds? Yep, Amina has read one third of the book and there are some more thirds left to work with. We need to find those out. Now I've put a value in there of 92. How did I get that value of 92? Look at the calculation that I've done. So I've done 276 divided by three. Do you want to talk me through how I would have gone about that calculation? So there are zero lots of 100. Well, there aren't, there isn't one lot of, uh, 100 lots of three in, in 200. So I've regrouped that 200 into the tens column and it's now 27 lots of 10. We know that 27 divided by 3 is 9, so I'm going to use my times table facts to help me. So 27 divided by 3 is 9. Then I've moved on to the 1s column. 6 divided by 3, that's an easy one, that's 2. So that's why I've put 92 into the value of 1 third. So each third is worth 92. Does that help me answer the question? It tells me how much Amina has read. So I know that she's read one third, so I can start to cross that off. In a minute, you'll see my hand starting to cross that off. But I know, but what I need to know is how much is left. Well, I now can see from the bar model that it's two thirds. I know that one third is worth 92. So two thirds is, is going to be 92 add 92. Or I could do double 92, or I could do two times 92, because that's the same thing. I know that nine and nine is 18. So I know that 90 and 90 is 180. And I know two and two is four. So my answer is 184. 184 what? Yep, 184 pages left to read. Okay, so when I was talking through that problem, I used a number of uh, problem solving strategies to help the pupil. I already had the calculation done for them. So there was, um, they didn't have to think about the numbers and what they needed to do. They just were ex looking at the structure of the problem. And we call this a worked example. It takes the pressure off pupils to actually understand what is being asked from them in the question, rather than just trying to find an answer. I also drew a bar model out to represent the problem as um, Sam showed earlier. And I asked them to put it in a context that they would understand. So this problem actually is in quite a nice context, reading a book, all, all pupils in school are gonna be reading books. But some of the problems are in context which are really unfamiliar for them. And this just gives, talking about the context gives them an opportunity to understand how the maths is set within the problem. Okay, Joe, if you go to the final slide. So just to summarise our five guiding principles of tutoring mathematics. So we've looked at using manipulatives and representations, using a blocked approach, teaching for conceptual understanding, making links to other areas of maths explicit, and teaching problem solving strategies. In the following work that we do through the recorded sessions and the following live sessions, 
we will be um, ensuring that our approach is woven, this approach is woven through all of the work that we do. So I'm going to hand over now to Lizzie for any um, questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Sam and Anna. Um, fantastic. What I'd like to do now is go through some of the questions that were submitted in advance of this session and hopefully provide you all with some answers. And um, if there are any questions that have been submitted during the session live or any questions that we haven't um, got opportunity to go through in as much depth this, um, in this session, um, or when it's able to answer um, in this session live, we'll be able to answer them um, in our frequently asked questions on the SP Tutors website. And also all of these questions um, will be answered on the website. And um, first question we've got, I'd like to direct to Anna. And that question is, how good does my maths knowledge need to be as a tutor of maths for SP Tutors, Anna? Okay, so I'd say it's important that you feel confident in your own ability in maths and that you understand the areas of those maths that you're going to be tutoring. Um, to know what that is, you would need to have a discussion with the class teacher so that you really understand the level that you'll be working at. Um, and of course, there are things you can do to develop your own mathematical knowledge, but you need to be confident in your abilities at the moment. Thanks, that's great. And the second question, what should I do if the children I'm working with have very different needs? Sam. Uh, good question. Um, like, like Anna said, really, you want to go to the, the key teacher, speak to the school uh, and, and make sure that you, you're aware of the student's needs, but also make sure that they have the right, the, the right grouping. And so have those conversations with, with the school, because ultimately it's in their best interest to make sure that the, the students are in the right place uh, and in the right group. So conversation with the key teacher is key to all of this, really. Thank you. And next question absolutely speaks to me as a, a parent who's been doing a lot of home learning in the past sort of six, seven months. What should I do if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? Or if the teacher sets me work that I don't understand? Anna. Um, okay, so if the teacher sets work that you don't understand, you must absolutely tell them that because that gives them an opportunity to explain to you. Um, and children, or any pupils will very quickly pick up if you um, are trying to bluff it a little bit. So it's always best to refer back to the teacher so they can get you have that opportunity to explain. And um, if you're caught uh, in the moment and you don't know it with a question that you don't know the answer to, that happens to teachers all the time. And it's absolutely fine to say, great question. I don't know the answer to that yet, but we are going to find out and I'm going to come back to you on that one. Excellent answer. Um, who do I go to for extra help with maths? Sam? Um, OK, well, once again, go go to the key teacher. Um, same again, really. Um, go and see uh, what, what they have in terms of resources at the school, what they're currently using. Uh, you've also, as part of SP Tutors, got the Tutor Know How app, uh, and we'll also be running some um, live webinars as well to support with, with the maths. Uh, and, and we've got some videos that are going to be produced to be put on the Tutor Know How app as well that will help you with the CPD. So hopefully all of those areas will support, support you if you're unsure. Um, I've got a few questions now which are about tutoring and SP tutors in general and I'm going to answer a few of those now. One of the questions is about the tools that we would recommend for online tutoring. SP tutors haven't aligned um, ourselves with any online tutoring platforms for the tutoring of mathematics because each school context is different and each school will have formulated their own approach during the pandemic. And we don't want to um, interfere with that process as it would complicate processes that have only just been embedded. Um, another question's come in, which was asking specifically about mathematics and asking how you might sketch or share diagrams or explanations with students online. Anna, um, in a, from a primary phase perspective, is there anything that you could share there about online um, support for pupils? Um, yeah, so, 
if we're doing things online again i would go with the schools the the approach that the school has taken um mathspot is a great resource and lots of teachers use that for using representations online it's free um a lot of schools that i work with use a program called Shobi, which um the schools you're in may use where pupils can um record their work share it with you and then you can they can annotate on on there as well and then you can give feedback and you can can give voice notes to give that feedback um, and you can annotate on their work as well so there's lots of different ways that schools use but the key thing really is that we don't want to be teaching pupils how to use technology we really want this to be the focus is on the maths because um, if they're having to learn the technology alongside the maths, it's just too much for them to focus on. So um, using think systems that they are really familiar with will give the best results. Sam, from a secondary perspective, I'm sure you're going to echo a lot of what Anna said there as well. Yeah, definitely. And to reiterate that point that, you know, find out what the schools use in themselves, because um, they may well have some programs that they've, they, they use for when they did online work um, that the students would already be used to. Um, I mean, certainly free websites, um, Anna mentioned MathSpot. Um, I mean, I showed the manipulatives at the beginning, but MathSpot uh, is a fantastic website um, where they've got all the manipulatives ready to go. So if you're not able to actually physically handle them, uh, you can show them in, in your online tutoring and therefore that will sort of show where the concept's coming from. All those quiz and air odds, Dean's blocks, um, bar modelling, you can do it all on there. Um, Dr Frost Maths uh, is free as well and that enables you to uh, share a whiteboard so you can write on it, show the the, the student and they can do the same and you can see what they're writing um, and there's also uh, Desmos that's really really good for again that whiteboard sharing um, so find out what the school's using uh, but there's some great free websites that you can utilize as well. Thank you both. SP Tutor's preferred model is face-to-face -face tutoring and that is given the evidence on impact for small group and one-to-one face-to-face tutoring. The next question is, what's the take up under the National Tutoring Programme? Um, SP tutors don't have access to the National Tutoring Programme data, um, but SP tutors have registered a wide variety of schools with varying needs across the east of England. Um, over 200 schools across all key stages um, have already registered and that number is growing by the day. Um, some want three pupils to be tutored in their schools, some want 245 pupils to be tutored. So as you can imagine, that is a huge range, um, but we're absolutely delighted by the uptake. Next question, um, I'll be answering a few of these because they're generic questions for SP tutors. Average number of lessons with an individual student under the National Tutoring Programme. Again, I'll try and answer more about SP tutors. Um, but for the National Tutoring Programme, each pupil um, for the National Tutoring Programme guide guidance will be working in groups of three um, or one to one for children with um, special educational needs. Um, and that's more pupils with more complex special educational needs. And these pupils are, in, um, pupils are entitled to a block of 15 hours of tutoring. And the length of sessions and frequency of sessions can be tailored to the individual needs of pupils and the school's capacity. Moving on to the next question, how quickly can we be up and running as it's taken many weeks to get this far? Um, S, uh, SP Tutors was approved as a tuition partner on the 2nd of November. Since then, we've been um, ensuring that we've got all the appropriate checks um, that includes um, processes to ensure safer recruitment, because that's at the heart of what we do. And um, we understand the frustration of waiting for the pre-employment checks to be done, absolutely. But this has been, there's been an absolutely significantly higher demand placed on the DBS service at the moment for a variety of reasons, not just because of the tutors, but as you can imagine, the volunteers that are going through at the moment to support with the pandemic and many, many other sectors. Our new team, SP Tutors, is working tirelessly to progress a significant number of new tutor applications, all of which need to be carried out in accordance with safer recruitment. And safeguarding is and always will be our top, top priority. 
Um, next question, our final question at the moment, oh, I've got two questions, apologies. How do you demonstrate value to schools in terms of quantitative data that shows impact? The National Tutoring Programme Evaluation Team collects data directly from schools. SP Tutor's part is to ensure tutors and schools collaborate consistently and effectively for maximum impact on learning for pupils. And the last question is about um, teaching walkthroughs and identifying which of the walkthroughs has the most impact. And I'm delighted that next week we'll be launching teaching walkthroughs for teaching for tutor know-how. And the idea there is that each of the 50 walkthroughs, and we advise that our tutors focus on the core 10 walkthroughs, each of those is about the tutor's individual context. So for one tutor, one of those walkthroughs may be more important for them than for another tutor. But at SP Tutors, we've been focusing on a core 10, and those core 10 are identified on the Tutor Know How app. If you've already registered with SP Tutors, we are working as fast as we can to get you an SP Tutors email, and that email will then get you access to the Tutor Know How app, and teaching walkthroughs is, um, is accessible as part of your training programme. I think now we have got, I'm just going to double check that we've got no more questions that have come through whilst I've been talking. Um, but I'd like to say thank you very, very much to everybody that's attended this evening. Uh, we will be sharing updates on our Twitter account, which is tutors underscore SP, and also by our Instagram account. So please do keep in touch. If you have any questions or if you'd like to register with us as a tutor, if you've not already registered, our email address is contact us at sptutors.co.uk. Please keep in touch. I look forward to seeing you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe.